my journey in this domain of accessibility started with my lived experience and shared experience in the space of disability. We started this practice of access for all and looking at inclusion in the spaces, particularly ours, to look at different ways of enabling inclusion in the space. And on that note, I would like to take this platform and ask the panel here that how are your personal and professional experiences meeting in your practice and its growth? What is the symbiotic nature of that? And is the idea of your professional practice informing you? Whoever wants to thank Everybody's looking at me. <laughs> uh, hi, thank you for having us. Uh, oh, it's got really bright. Um, I think for many of us who live uh, with our many, many, many identities, uh, disability being one of them, uh, and who are creators of one kind or another, because uh, I think we have three very different artists and creators on the stage right now. Um, I can't do visual arts to save my life. I wish I could, but I can't. Um, but I'm a performing artist. I've spent my entire life uh, working with space and working with how we embody spaces, even before I knew that's what I was doing, that's what I was doing. Um, my queer body enters spaces, my disabled body enters spaces when I go on stage and perform, whether or not that performance welcomes those parts of me, I bring them anyway, because they are in my body already. So trying to somehow split or see or define separately my art practice, my writing work, which is also an art practice. Um, and the identities I carry is almost like trying to split hairs, right? That it's, they are so intertwined that really um, you can't. Even before uh, I think any of us are conscious of the fact that our art uh, is directly connected and being born out of our bodies and the world we experience and how we experience it, it's already happening far before then. Um, so I guess for me, the simple answer, and I'm going to keep this, short because also all three of us are very very interested in actually getting questions from the audience um, because that's where the fun really begins um, but yeah i would say for me even before i uh, started identifying officially as queer or disabled my work was already queer and disabled work it was already speaking to that um, to those identities and being directly connected with it because there's no way to really remove parts of yourself when you're creating as any kind of artist work that is born out of you. And I think for disabled folks especially, it is born out of our bodies and our minds in a much more grounded way because we experience everything through that body and that mind. So that would be my... Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, continuing with what Martha said, thanks to say that was, um, as someone who's also disabled, you know, um, it's not that um, my art or my activism only became valid when I started putting it out there or when it started um, the monetary thing came in, right? It was valid months before. Um, with my growing up as a disabled child, um, as a disabled woman, um, my queerness cannot be distinguished from my queerness, my disability. But at the same time, um, when you have multiple identities, what comes first, right? Or is it a competition one? Um, how do you fit into this very narrow space between queer and disabled communities, um, something that is very underrepresented. Um, for a lot of us, um, we, uh, like I formed Bible Institute in India out of survival, right, because I never had any um, reference point growing up. Um, I didn't know how to view the world. I didn't know 
my work was in the world um, as someone who's disabled. Because we have to so so many times like how I'm going to survive and right? how I'm going to do the bare minimum of survival. So I used to tell myself, okay, how am I going to survive with legs that don't work or move the way I want them to or a left hand that doesn't work, right? Or disabled left hand. So to really find my purpose um, in the world, I formed this collective. Um, and I also feel a lot of us are forced to realize our identities, um, forced to be activists, to advocate for ourselves, because no one else will. Or <laughs> no one else will uh, like just be that reference point, right? There's no um, guide on how to be disabled and queer in India. So, um, yeah, um, and I really feel like um, other narratives and others, um, storytelling has really helped um, with the simple fact that I'm not alone. Even though that's a very cheesy uh, thing. Yeah, okay. But very common. Yeah. So, um, some of my I cannot and will not um, separate my um, professional um, life from my personal practices because we cannot. Uh, 
so that was a bit of a shocker. Um, but there was also many other things. And for example, what that translation has meant to me now as a 30-something year old practitioner um, who has really embraced all those elements is that I don't let the medium guide me. I guide the medium. I don't let somebody say, but this is a traditional form, you're only allowed to do it like this, you have to look like this, you have to be like this, this is how deep you have to, your arabandi has to be. I say, you know what, that's not what my body does. But I am a dancer, I've trained my whole life, I know the art because the art lives inside me. Right? So I guide where the art goes, not the other way around. And that can mean that I do half a Bharatanatyam performance that then, then turns into uh, I don't know, performance that is just poetry, but that's still my art because that is what my body requires. That is what my art wants to be. And I think that's why art that is created from the margins is so deeply interesting because it really says to all the boundaries. That's like, through you. You know, that if I am the artist, then I will say what this art does. Um, and really claiming that fully. Thank you. I think really interesting ways to talk about the element of participation, right? And how you are, are supposed to participate versus how you prefer to do that. And just bringing that to my another observation about the idea of non-participation and rest in the spaces like art festivals or even the ecosystem from the lens of an artist or even the audience, if you would like to talk more on that. Yeah. Um, I think for me, I would kind of turn that on his head because I feel um, it's not about non-participation, uh, but it's about how can we have different ways of participating in a space. So, can participate, uh, and when you take rest, like, can rest be a part of participation? Um, do we always have to go into an art space and stand erect and look at an art piece? Can we participate by lying down and engaging with an art, with, with a kind of, uh, with an inspiration or, an, uh, or experience that's been created? And I think um, what tends to happen sometimes with accessibility is we separate. We create um, separated areas of rest. We create, um, we, we use terms like non-participation. Um, and I think that's where it becomes problematic. Because uh, it, what is necessary is finding ways to integrate um, and just have different ways. Like if say I'm going, if uh, if there is an art talk that is happening, or an art walk, sorry, does everyone need to walk um, in that? Way? Can there be points of rest while you are kind of moving through a space? Um, and I think that's something I've been kind of thinking about and exploring, even in my own practice. Um, even like recently when I created, when I worked on my own show, um, I was trying to think of different ways of physical engagement. Can there be a part in the show where, you know, you can lay up pillows, there are, there are, there are going to kind of lie down and, and it lends to a different experience. And I think we often, so, um, we, we sort of go with this kind of white cube uh, way of moving to a space which is able to at its very inception.
but just integrating that and affirming that more than inclusion, right? So, um, yeah, just affirming identity um, rather than this um, surface level of um, just um, insisting on inclusion. Um, just bringing in belonging and affirming. Um, I, to be forewarned, my answer is probably going to go away from the question. Just I have this feeling in my brain already. But starting with the rest. <laughs> um, I think part of the problem is that all of us are affluent in spaces. Um, I think it's, okay, this is the space, this is how it's supposed to be, this is how we've done it, some like that, oh. Okay, but now how do we get somebody who can't stand for longer than 15 minutes to be here? Oh shit, we're going to have to add something. Oh, there's no ramp. How is this person going to get on stage? We're going to have to add something. We are the addition. And I think, first of all, we have to also think about the fact that rest and non-participation should also be available to everybody. <laughs> Why is it that only disabled folks need it or get to ask for it? I mean, art is intimidating. Having to walk through that, I mean, most of you, I assume, have been at least doing some walking through the um, galleries there. It's a lot, right? I mean, shake your head if it's a lot. It's a lot. Okay. It's not just a lot for me. Um, what happens when I want, when I just want a break, right? Or when I don't want to be constantly hearing everybody socializing. I just want to look at the art because I want to be able to feel what happens when I look at the art. Where are my options to experience differently? And why do I have to demand it after I arrive? Why am I not thought of before? Is one of the biggest questions for disabled folks. Right? I will come and say, Acha, I don't speak this language. They will be, Acha, okay, we will provide somebody who speaks this language. Right? But I can't do this. Okay, therefore we will do I think in our very thought of how we create spaces, we are already doing a disservice. We are already saying the majority, which in our minds is still able-bodied, cis, etc., 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 is still our reference point. If we cannot start thinking differently, we cannot create differently. It's as simple as that. And which is why, I mean, let me clear, all three of us, none of us are consultants. We are not accessibility consultants. We are artists, we are, we are disabled people. We live our lives as disabled people, right? So we are also coming from a place of experience, of having actually had to be on the other side. And maybe that's where the answers lie. Because only if you've experienced it can you really begin talking about it, not from a place of addition, but from a place of foundation, right? So when you invite folks like us, right, into these spaces, that's okay, I know, I, I, the reason I'm saying this is because there's a big uh, discussion between whose emotional labor should it be to find solutions. And it's, a, it's something that came up with the three of us. Why do we have to think of everything? What, you know, what are the things that we need? Everything gets asked to us. It's okay, we do have some of the answers. But of course, then invite us, pay us, understand that we are bringing an expertise, right? We are not coming free, we are to buy. Why should that be the point of view? So I think we have to completely chuck this whole idea of this is the basic uske upar hum dheere dheere ek karke add karenge because we'll never get there. Right? That will take us the next 100 years before we get to really thinking differently. We have to think about the different bodies that come into spaces. All the bodies. And yes, there will never be all the answers but at least we will be thinking of it from a place that isn't this is normal, everybody else is a token addition. Because that's not what the world actually looks like. And then you can't say, oh, but, you know, there's no uh, deaf people coming here. Why do we have an interpreter? If you don't have an interpreter, why do deaf person come here? Just to add to that, it's not about creating translatable formats. It's not about creating a, like, when I said, creating a space and then being like, now how do we make it accessible to someone else who is hearing impaired or who is visually impaired and then creating this additional translatable format. Can we just be a bit more imaginative in how we curate from its inception? Like, Can we start 
creating experiences that are multi-sensorial, that, that are, um, it's not about being accessible to different bodies, but it's about creating spaces for diverse bodies, abilities, um, and it's, yeah, and, and I think it's just how can we reimagine spaces of rest and recuperation within us? It doesn't need to be so sterile. And yeah, and I think when we just start doing that within our practice, then it doesn't become about, you know, okay, these are the list of points we have to do to make something more accessible. And I think we just need to be a bit more imaginative in how we kind of approach all of this. Thank you. Yes, yes, we are. I see you. I'm sorry, I'm not an artist uh, and I'm not an ableist. And I believe that uh, all kinds of classification, whether it is food groups, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, whether it is kachra alag karo, wet based, dry based, whether it is party clothing, casual clothing whether it is the gender classifications, age group classifications, animals, plants, uh, microbes, intelligent, non-intelligent, uh, we all understand the world in bite size. But when the, it, it all becomes bite size and goes into the tummy, it's a mishmash. And that's what gives us the energy. So it is from some kind of boxing that we comprehend and once we comprehend, we realize the boxing is irrelevant, okay? So it is a vicious cycle. And uh, the main thing which I was trying to bring over here is that um, we were talking about how can we be imaginative so that we can be more inclusive. Uh, again, this is a conundrum according to me because your imagination largely draws from your experiences. A child who is left free is way more imaginative because has had a lot many more experiences to sort of assimilate, uh, interact with, take it on their own terms. And when you take it in on your own terms, you're able to stretch those boundaries, I feel. So how do you push for an imaginative space uh, or imaginative sort of, what can I say, arrangements or imaginative world? where imagination itself is probably largely driven by your experiences. If you want to take that? Sure. sure. Um, I was a teacher for five years. One, it's our responsibility. Uh, as adults, do we create what we allow into children's lives? Uh, yes, we draw from experiences, and the more sterile our experiences, the harder it is to do anything. Diversity, right? Um, I was a openly queer disabled teacher. Um, I, one of my students was supposed to be a she's not here, she could vouch for me. Um, but we have to change how we live around our children. I mean, the parents say, how much do you keep from your children of your reality? How much do you hide from them? And what is the purpose of that? Right? And how much do we think about it? I think one of the fastest ways um, and most efficient ways, although those are not words I usually use, um, to actually change this and allow for imagination it is to stop hiding children away from the world. Because why weren't there disabled kids in my class when I was in first ever? Why are they separated? Why did I have to learn about it when, I, when it started happening to me? Right? I mean, it's the most ridiculous thought and yet here we are stuck as if we don't understand this. We understand this but we won't change it. Go to your children's schools. Demand better. Say that don't segregate us. I mean, again, what century are we? Unless we are able to take that responsibility into our schools, into our workplaces, it is not going to change. And that's the only way to change. So as somebody who is not a professional who works with children, but works with children on her own terms and time, I do see that there is a forward motion in this direction where there is Gradually, even in grades as young as six and seven, and there is conversation around identity. There is a healthy conversation around identity. In my own home, there is a very healthy conversation that identity 
is again now being classified as male, female, queer, me, they, them. No, it's a fluid space. As much as you allow yourself to feel a certain way now, please allow yourself to feel differently a few years from now. So it is, I mean, we, we look at it uh, very black and white. That's how the society has, uh, or history has drawn upon how to comprehend the world around us. But as we become more intelligent, I think uh, it is always great to question boundaries, push them, blur them, reinvent them, bend them, and more about you guys. The more intelligent, the more courageous. So that's very important. Just let you know, I used to be a scientist. <laughs> I'm a full-time mom now. I work with children, and that's my kid there, but an artist. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we. Do we have more that questions from the audience? Uh, so I also dance Bharatanatyam and uh, a lot of I think the sort of validity in especially in classical dance space comes from conforming to very specific disciplines, specific aesthetic presentation and things like that and you often feel like you shouldn't be on stage if you don't look a certain way or perform a certain way. So I just wanted to ask how navigating that very traditional narrow space was like. It was. I mean, and I, I can't say that I've completed it in any way because uh, I think traditional art forms in general uh, rely on a particular kind of discipline. Uh, and then everything gets thrown into this way. Discipline in a space, of course, can't have green hair, can't have glasses, can't, uh, you know, can't be uh, larger than a particular size, etc. Et it's an endless list that nobody really can be. Um, I think. The longer you do it and the more you find it within yourself and then the courage to say, you know what, I will I will do this form the way I need to and I don't need you to say, oh, it's okay. And that's hard. That's hard. I'm not saying it's not hard. It's still hard for me. And it's very likely that you will not get invited. As, like, I mean, my entire life was, I was meant to be a professional dancer. I started dancing when I was four. That was the plan, right? <laughs> Um, you won't get invited to be the, the you know the big uh, all the big stages and stuff, but that's okay. It we we'll get there to that, but the more of us who say you know I'm going to do this the way I'm going to do it, we get one step, one person closer to it. But it's tough. So I mean, <laughs> so my question is for the whole panel. There was another uh, queer person on the top panel. Uh, they said they don't know where their work trajectory will take them as there's no predecessor for the sort of work that they're doing. That there's no other queer Dalit artist and uh, they don't know what kind of trajectory their career will take, what kind of places their work would take them. And you raise a sort of similar point that uh, like there's not enough representation for this and you're like uh, in a way of course people who are like raising these issues and bringing these issues into light and uh, uh, starting conversations on important topics like this. So I'm asking you, what is the kind of legacy and what is the kind of work that you would like to leave behind? What is the kind of like mark that you would like to leave behind? Yeah. Uh,
I mean, we all have kind of internalized that ableism because I have always felt not enough because, oh, I can't put in that much more. I, I don't, you know, and, and but when I started sort of redefining that and being like, maybe this is the way I work, or maybe I take a break at this time and that's actually okay, and kind of create my own tactics to create, to live, to kind of navigate through systems. I actually end up producing a lot more, I actually end up being more efficient, I actually end up being able to kind of grow my work a lot more because I have created that path for myself um, rather than subscribe to a particular um, yeah, like pathway that is the way we are meant to. And I think it does come from like, talking to other artists and people with shared experience but sort of almost sharing your resources, seeing you know the ways in which you have sort of been able to create or produce or move through systems, and I think that's where that area of that fills that gap of the lack of representation as well. Yes, sir. Uh, we have time uh, Yeah, I just want to say one thing. Um, we are disabled people have always been here. Um, we just haven't paid any attention to them. And they have, they have always been this place of um, community and solidarity and survival. We've just not... Yeah. We... Yeah. We have There's one more question. Or don't receive, 
um, how much are you believe or not believe, right? Um, in um, in the in the community, self diagnosis is a is a thing because a lot of us don't have the resources um, to go to the to go to professionals, right? So even looking at self diagnosis and um, disability justice as um, a resource with which we can learn how to honor invisible disabilities. Yeah. Also, some of the, some of the, some of the extension on that we can answer afterwards outside as well. So, okay. Just the uh, last question. I want to know the very first point is disability. Why are we calling it special? And why are we giving it a negative connotation? And I, by the way, have my own disabilities. I'm an MS person. So my point is, is a general question. Why is it disability? I think it's disability because it is how the system disables you. Yes. Okay? So we do have to affirm that. Yes. Disability, uh, when you think of the social model of disability, it is the essence of it is it's not the person's medical or physical impairment, it's that society is made in an ableist format that disables people with different types of bodies. Um, yeah. And I think another thing I wanted to add to what, uh, the previous question is I think we have always um, sort of uh, internalized, I mean, my own conditioning, conditioning also always defines disability under a homogenous sort of frame as someone with a perceivable marker or a visible sort of image to it. And so it took me like years to even perform that, okay, you know, in that disability goes across bodies, um, it sometimes is hidden, it's invisible, it, um, and there was definitely the sense of not, there is the sense of always not being disabled enough to claim that word in a claiming space. And, um, but when you think about it in this way, that this society disables so different bodies in different ways, then it is a disability and it is not special. I mean, no one wants <laughs> It's not about, no, it's not about being special because it is just about the, it's as simple as the fact that society disables you. That's all. It's a matter of fact. Yeah. Also, uh, I feel 
evening, apart from visible and visibility, um, drugs, um, fairies. It's also, I don't know how to articulate this, but just how accessible people are, right? Their understanding of visibility and just giving basic agency to the disabled person. Um, yeah, just um, just being like a respectable person, right? Towards a towards another same person. Yeah. I remember magic. Uh, my what I was thinking was, for example, in the audience here right now, how many of you are uh, <coughs> players in art fairs or spaces? Like, if you are a gallerist. Or somebody who makes decisions, please raise your hand. Okay, so that's part of the problem, right? Who comes to these conversations? Who is listening and who wants to know? Um, and why aren't they here? Right? They have, there's one conversation happening about how do we change this, and none of them are here today. I don't think I need to explain that any further. Thank you. Thank you so much for this honest.